Okay, welcome everyone to another edition of Tea Time. Yeah. <laughs> Today we have uh, Kim Solez, a uh, sort of uh, outsider normally from our little group, but he's part of our larger group of AI people. And, um, and he's, he's, he, he, he teaches a course. You, you might want to take it. T Tyler's taken it. Some, other guys, uh, some, others, some others of us have taken it. And I teach sometimes in it. And, and Patrick teaches, and Osmar teaches, and Jonathan teaches, and uh, sometimes and all kinds of interesting people from outside. Anyway, uh, Kim is, 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 is here to tell us a little bit about his, his view of uh, what's going on in AI. Okay, well, thank you. I, I welcome this opportunity. Um, I, I'm going to give you just a little taste of my world. How does it compare to yours? I guess mine's a little bit more colorful and a lot less logical. I mean, that's what I always feel. I don't know what you think. But so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, an initiative that Mallory Chipman and I have called the Future and All That Jazz. And it's basically about uh, communicating important <coughs> messages about AI safety with uh, diverse audiences using diverse means. What does that mean? I think there are a lot of people out there that we'd like to reach who probably will never listen to a lecture. I mean, they might listen to a few words on the news, or they might listen to a poem or to music, but they're never going to sit still for a lecture on these topics that interest us. So that's the idea then of using poetry, music, and sound bites to reach people. So this is a slide that I use a lot. It's probably quite familiar <laughs> to you. But um, in January 2015, there was a meeting in Port Puerto Rico of 79 people. And Rich held a quite different view from most of those people. And it seems to me, as it probably seems to you, that his view was the common sense view, the logical one. And the one that would save the human race, because ultimately, if machines are smarter than we are and we really piss them off, <laughs> then we're, we're going to be toast. And if we lie to them, if, if, if we plan to enslave them, if that is all that we do, then it just seems like we're going to ultimately lose big time. And there may be a future for them and not for us. So as Rich has said, we have to be kind, empathetic, friendly toward them, and uh, inevitably we will become less important. We have to lose our sense of entitlement and food AIs in our circle of uh, empathy. So that's the idea we're trying to get across. And there are many famous people, as you know, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Stephen Haw Hawking, and so on, with what I would consider a much more radical view that you know enslavement is the right answer to this problem. Now, you may wonder what's going to happen to the human race. This is what National Geographic thinks we will look like in 2045, given trends and intermarriage and that sort of thing. And then everybody's thinking, all of us have cognitive biases about this uh, exponential curve and the, the idea of machines becoming smarter first than individual humans in about 2029 and smarter than the whole human race in 2045. So we presume that most human beings won't be employed, but just like I've said up at the top there, most of you probably think that in the particular area you're in, you will still be employed because it requires this unique humanness that you're, you're imbued with, and so you'll, you'll be fine and everybody else won't be. I, I think that's a, a cognitive bias we all fall into. It's almost certainly wrong. So although I've said here that kidney physicians and renal pathologists may be the only people employed, I, I really don't have any evidence for that 
So why sure. would you say that? Now, you're a kidney physician. <laughs> yeah. So, well, well the, the argument would be that the stuff I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, like um, <coughs> making organs from stem cells and so on, is so extraordinarily complicated that machines won't be able to master that for decades, that it, it will require human input. That would be the argument. Um, and I like that argument, obviously. I'm just not absolutely sure that it's <laughs> correct. Now, believe it or not, this is what I looked like in 1991 <laughs> <laughs> when uh, the, the uh, BAMF classification began. I began it with Dr. Rackison, and that's what she looked like then. And so it's now 25 years later. And I'm going to talk a lot today about numbers, like reaching people and so on. So the, these are like characteristic pictures of microscopic slides in the BAMP classification. And these are the various uh, political and scientific developments over the past 25 years. We've finally established a foundation, a nonprofit Swiss foundation that I had that is the, the infrastructure for what we're doing here in transplant pathology. And you might think that something that's 25 years old would be getting sort of old and tired and nobody would be much interested in it. So the exciting thing is that the number of publications last year was higher than it's ever been. So it seems, who knows why, but it seems still to be relevant in its 24th and 25th year. So now, <clears throat> how many people does my work life reach? Uh, Google Scholar says I have 17,000 citations, but that's over a very long period of time. I, I once said that I thought that the number of people I'm in contact with at any one time is about 8,000. And in fact, if, if you look at various places where I've spoken, the videos from those meetings seem to max out at about 8,000, 9,000 views. And I've noticed that uh, Rich, it, it, that's similar to the places he goes, they tend to max out at a butt butt. So I think that's what I, I can claim, that I'm influencing or noticed by about eight to 9,000 people. Now, because you're all good Canadians and, and the Big Bang Theory is the most popular TV program in Canada, then you would be interested in the fact that 80 million people watch it. And the subject matter is similar to the subject matter of your work life. If they are not taking anything seriously, but I think that is kind of the target, that in theory, for the subjects we talk about at work, we could reach 80 million people and we're reaching 8,000. So that's a difference of 10,000 fold between what we're doing now and what we presumably could do. So this year I'm creating a new discipline in pathology, tissue engineering pathology, and I presume that because of that, that the number of published references to my work will, will continue to go up, but um, it's still many orders of magnitude below what would be ideal if we're really working on consequential things that the survival of the human race depends upon. This shows kind of the mechanism of how our meetings work. Uh, I, I won't go through the details. Uh, you can imagine the pride with which we put this graphic together. You know, I, I'm not sure whether this is the ideal, but we're very proud of it. This is some of the people who are involved and their roles and conferences and so on. And the field is changing quite quickly. In November 2014, this cover appeared on the best journal in the field, the American Journal of Transplantation, Building New Hearts, about stem cell generated organs. 
And a lot of people in the field, if you would interrogate them, would have said this is decades off, and this cover began to indicate to them that that's not the case. Yeah. This is okay. Yeah. So I mean, if you look at that rate of change, how long until we don't need hearts? I mean, the entire field you're working in, and all of our medical colleagues, assume we have bodies that are made of meat, uh, and, or meat machine hybrids. How long do we don't need it? Like, it, will this actually be made potentially irrelevant very quickly? Yeah, I, I don't think we'll be uploading our consciousness to non-biological uh, substrates by 2045. Right. I think it'll be sometime okay. after that. Okay. So biology is still going to matter at least okay. until the 2040s. Good. Okay. But you're right. Cool. At cool. some cool. point, okay. yeah. At at some point, uh, biology may just be a kind of archaic, interesting model for something that you know machines have now gotten much better fine-tuned than hmm. biology ever could. So the world is changing rapidly. You, you need to do things in kind of the entertainment realm to jumpstart people's thinking that you know things really are changing, that they have to, to learn new things, think about new things, think about new concepts. Um, so like the singularity in our area of medicine is kind of exactly this repopulation of solid organs. You take an organ, flush out the original cells, introduce stem cells, and they regrow, and then you've got something that is immunologically compatible with who, whoever you wish to put it into. So that's the idea. Can things ever go wrong? Yes. You, you, you can get cells ending up in the wrong places. You can get things that are misshaped. You can get things where there should be cells in their heart, or the, everything you can imagine. So that's why there will be a field of uh, tissue engineering pathology. That, that, that's, and that presumably will be tenfold greater in size than the field I'm in now, <coughs> transplantation pathology, because we're only serving 10% of the people who actually need organs. The others die or have very unsatisfied unsatisfactory lives. So we're really not doing very well serving the human need. So um, in 91, we began in this very small building, the Trans-Canada Pipeline Pavilion at the Banff Center. The meeting was 21 people. We've now come a long way. Um, now, thinking then about your area of interest. One way in which pathology and in fact all of medicine, I suppose all of human society may change, it is that there will be a new job and that is the best friend a robot ever had. To be the best friend a robot ever had could be, or a you know, machine, sentient machine ever had, could be a very high profile important job in the future. Now am I surrounded by Machines at work, I really am. Every moment, there's a machine beside me somewhere that could wake up and say, hey, Dr. Solas, haven't you been noticing? You've been making a lot of mistakes recently. Why don't you let me do it? How many machines are there that, that, that could do that? Maybe six or seven in my work life. There's the tissue processor, the uh, virtual microscopy system, uh, the power wall, the uh, uh, voice recognition, the uh, pathology information system, the clinical in information system, any one of them. I mean, they're big, they're powerful, they're getting more powerful, more complex all, all the time. And you could imagine that they could become a sentient entity uh, that we, we would need to take seriously. So this is, this is very real to me, this, this idea of uh, co-evolution with machines and doing it in the right way. You know, it, it's not that we have to convince everybody that the Rich Sutton way is the only way. We, can, we, we want them to
to at least pay attention sufficiently to that way that they consider it in the mix of possible approaches. And that they always do because it's the most natural human approach. I, I mean, as Rich says, humans are not naturally afraid of things, generally. And, and then we do tend to cooperate with others. When we're polite, when we're proudest of our behavior, it's when we're cooperating with other sentient beings. So that seems a kind of logical way to proceed. Now, I've recently on May 12th won the Faculty of Medicine's Mentoring Award, and I thought, I don't win awards very often. It's been seven years since I've won any award. And I thought, I've got to kind of leverage this and make other stuff up of it. So um, I, I figure that it will make all three of these things easier. Tissue engineering pathology to start that discipline to somehow mainstream these ideas of uh, the AI future and how it should go and to reach members of the general public that you cannot reach through lectures. Um, Mallory Chipman is 21. I met her at the Yardbird Suite. Uh, she's Tommy Banks' uh, granddaughter. You may know he's one of uh, Edmonton's most famous jazz uh, musicians, former senator, so he's also a politician. So he introduced her two years ago. I was quite bold, and I went up and asked for her phone number and stuff and, and started to kind of interact with her at that point. And so we have... Uh, come up with this idea, which we're now, we've done twice in Edmonton, we, on January 19th and March 8th, and Rich was there on March 8th, it was very, very nice to have him in our midst, where there, there are two portions of the, the evening. The first is sort of me presenting basic ideas and then reciting some kind of amateurish poet, poems, and then we have professional poets and musicians. The first half is kind of a set piece. We know what we're doing. There's a schedule of what the sequence is, and then the second half is completely improvised with themes, but otherwise it's completely experimental improvised. So on August 16th and 17th in uh, London, we're going to do that for the London Futurists. You may know that the London Futurists, uh, in terms of futurism, one of the highest profile and, and best known entities out there in terms of moving future science ahead. This is the, uh, the graphic that, that we have used for this. Um, I do really like it. I'd be willing to be talked out of it someday, but every time we, we do one of these shows, we put this in the background. And what's cool about it, nobody has ever asked me any questions about this. They've never asked me why I'm using it or what it is or anything. So it seems to be one of those pictures that people get an immediate message of what's going on. You know, there's a robot and a child, the, the building that they're in, has aspects that are both futuristic and you know old-fashioned and so on. So it's kind of it, it, it's a very good graphic connecting a lot of things. And how do you know that I was impressed by this graphic? Well, you may know that in graphic services where you can buy pictures to use, you can get an extended license. And you know that's much more costly. Most of you have never done that. But that, the only time I ever did that is with this picture. <laughs> so I paid $80 to get an extended le license for this so I can use it for for-profit things and for large entities that go to many thousands of people and so on. So um, that's basically it. That, that's what I had to tell you. I, I think. The challenge here, I've said it's all about the numbers, but of course you would realize it's not all about the numbers. There, there are many other you know, considerations here. But the simplest way to think about it is that we have an important message to impart, 
and currently we're reaching around 9,000 people and we'd right, like to reach the 80 million and I'm sure that's possible. Uh, one of the exciting things about teaching young people is they're sort of up to any challenge and so the first year that I taught the technology and future medicine course in which there's a project with the students I talked about the uh, TV um, PBS program Nova and how many millions of people it reaches so this student contacted the Nova program say I, I have this Dr. Solis, he'd like to be on your program, what would it take, and so on. So his, his paper was then the nuts of bolt and, and bolts of what, you know, the process was if I actually wanted to get on the high-profile TV program. We didn't actually do that, but I thought it was very bold. So if any of you want to do something e equally bold, I, I think, um, you know, professors, sometimes our days are a bit dull, and, and when you get a proposal like that that affects us personally so so much it tends to sort of grab you and uh, so it, it it is possible i think you know the 80 million i, I can't tell you exactly how but it is within the realm of possibilities some of you know that my office is unique i think in all of the academic world I'm a senior guy, I've been a full professor for a long time, I'll be 70 years of, of age on, on June 20th. But for the last year, I've shared the coolest room in our Florida University Hospital with students and fellows, young physicians in, in training ranging at an age from 18, like these guys, to about 28. And it works very well, and we are cohabiting in this space. And the other person who's in the space is Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. So he's there as a constant reminder of this numerical challenge that we have. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. That's the talk. I don't know how much over. I guess I'm not too much over. I think I'm a minute and 17 seconds over, which isn't too bad. <laughs> I'm really interested in ideas from you and your reaction to this. You think this is going to work? You think this is totally lame? If, if you were to ask the average person on the street, man or woman, whether they can name a single poet, you know, mo most of them can. But if, if you ask them if they have a song that they like, if there's song lyrics that they like, most of them do. So, so in a sense, everybody has a kind of intrinsic interest in poetry and music and sound bites. I think there, there, there are repetitive sounds in your life that you come to like, that you sort of perk up your ears. Somebody could connect them with an important idea that would assure humanity's not just survival, but actually that Mankind, womankind thrives, you know? I mean, why not? That, that things get better because all those things that human beings cannot solve at the moment, you know, pollution, global warming, human conflict, the fact that males all over the world are fighting with each other. You could imagine that actually machines could nip all that in the bud and you wake up one morning and the oxygen tension would be higher than it's ever been Pollution's gone, global warming's gone, the level of the ocean's going down, and when any man decides to start fighting with any other, it's just sort of immediately, gently, benignly wound down, and you find that. Which, of course, is the other thing we, we talk about in the course. In theory, the world would be a much better place if women ran everything, because they're less territorial, less likely to kill each other, and so on. But that's not really practical. This idea of getting you know, machines to wind down conflict is, is a better solution than you know, getting rid of all the men, or having <laughs> no men lead any <laughs> You had to, had to compare those two things. OK, yeah, other questions, comments?
Yes. Well, I was thinking about the numerical challenge and the other way which, which um, people in our field sometimes hope to influence the world is through, uh, uh, you know, products like uh, the iPhone is probably known by more people than the Big Bang Bang. Big Bang. Sure, yes. And yes. Uh, maybe Siri, maybe Siri by now. Yeah. Um, or by software, we can make, yeah. Whispering to you in your sleep while you, you have it on alarm mode, it's like, hey, yeah, I your friend. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, we could put, yeah, serious and AI, which is our friend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I. How else can we, uh, do we hope to influence large numbers of people? What do you think? I mean, if you want to go for a like, really young audience, it's because you can get them with games, right? Because like, if they stop portraying AI as an enemy, or a, but instead as an ally, that's something we're going to really might suggest mm -hmm. some positive. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in uh, a good city for that. You know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, game developers. Uh, we're in a good department for that. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And I mean, one of the cool things, I you probably, some of you get tired of hearing me talk about this, but if you look at the U.S. map, all the major cities except one are on the U.S. map. So we are the only major city in Canada that's off the edge of the U.S. map. So, you know, it's kind of amazing that anything important could, could occur here, but maybe we can save the world. So. <clears throat> So, uh, what do you mean? Is that okay for a moment? So, is, there, is it possible that it's actually good if people fear AI because that's sort of a buffer against, you know, there's like a lot of public um, pressure against creating bad AI. And if everyone thinks AI is going to be friendly and whatever, then even if somebody makes bad AI, then it's just going to slip under the radar, right? Yeah. So. See, so what, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to, you know, eliminate Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Steve, Stephen Hawking? you know, Nick Bostrom from the world. No, no. I, I mean, they, they are factors. I, I think they're even positive factors in a sense. We just need to kind of counterbalance that. We, we, we don't have to, you know, erase the, the competition. We don't have to say that we're, ours must be the only voice or that fearing AI has no positive aspects. I think fearing AI will make us appropriately cautious, that sort of, sort of thing. I think that you're right about that. But it's, it's when it seems like all of the voices are on the fear, you know, enslavement side, at least in terms of the, the headlines, you know, that, then I think that that's not heading for, a, you know, benign, favorable outcome. And, um, and I guess my second question is that this whole techno-utopian outlook, uh, it's nice and it's something that we believe in, but is any of it evidence-based? So are we just promoting another religious idea that you do all these things and good things happen? Mm -hmm. And do we have evidence to support that point of view to make that claim to other people? Yeah. So there's still a possibility that technology can ruin us all, and we, we yeah. try not to go in that direction, but I mean, it is a possibility. Yeah. Well, in, in the course, uh, technology and the future of medicine, we pride ourselves in the diverse voices that we have. We have technology skeptics, technology advocates, you know, we have many different vantage points and point of, points of view represented. And the evidence that that's a good thing is quite strong. You probably heard uh, Osmer talk about uh, celestial navigation. In 1998, the training of ship cap captains changed. But they didn't have to learn how to navigate by the stars anymore. Yeah, you know, it's the age of computers. You don't need this old-fashioned stuff. And very soon afterwards, there were these huge super tank tankers dead in the water in the middle of the ocean, the computer had failed, and nobody knew how to navigate without computing. So they began teaching it again. And now ship captains need to be able to use the sex. There are, you know, computer aids when your you know, computer is working, but they're they're old-fashioned ideas like that. 
that we, we, and there are many of them, that's just one. It isn't that that's the only old, old idea that's worth hanging on to. There are actually a bunch of old uh, ideas that are very sound and, and worth hanging on to. So I'm not here to really push just one point of view, I, but I think to get this idea of benign coevolution, cooperation, um, as something that people would always mention in any discussion. I think that's what I'm, what I'm after. I'm not after a world in which that's the only thing that people ever talk about, but where it is uniformly considered. It's a part of the balance. It, it, it's you know something that people expect to hear about. Um, this idea of keeping sentient AI in a, in a basement unconnected to the internet where it, it can only uh, respond in single digits or, you know, yes, no, to every question and so on. I mean, you, you know much more about this than I do, but it seems to me in the long run that is not going to work, you know. Make somebody really mad. <laughs> yes. And how, how would you, you feel? They're, they're saying, Okay, we want to make it completely indifferent to whether it's turned off or on. So the computer doesn't care. It, it, it's going along, everything's going great, and you say, I want to turn you off, and the computer says, sure, that's totally fine. It seems, seems to me that's kind of ridiculous to, to, to want that in a sentient machine, you're wanting a serious flaw. I mean, how could you trust that machine to do anything else if, if it's completely indifferent to whether it's turned on or off? So, yeah, anyway, that, that's my feeling. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Kim. You're very welcome.